Hello, it's Keith here and this is lesson 9 of the multi-platform series of my Z80 programming tutorials. Now this is going to be fulfilling the request of one of my Patreon backers. We're going to start looking at how to create a Pong game in Z80 in the simplest way possible. So today we're going to start the beginnings of the game, we're going to process the user input and we're going to create a simple paddle as you can see on screen and we're going to be just using basic text graphics because we want to keep things as simple as possible today. So you can see here we can move our Pong paddle up and down, left and right, and we've got boundary checking on the cursor. Now next time we'll add a second player which will be computer controlled and we'll have a ball bouncing around the screen and scoring and things. So we're just going to be starting today with how to read in the user input and process that into a moving object on the screen. So let's make a start and have a look. So the basis of today's game is going to be the Grind Z80 project. You'll notice the top of the code here, there's a lot of complex code and at the bottom there's some stuff at the footer as well, but it's basically all been taken straight from Grime Z80. And this was just to get the system running on all of the Z80 systems that I cover in my tutorials, because obviously there's a lot of different configuration needed there. So for simplicity, I'm using that basic code. But if you don't want to use that, then you can just use your own text drawing routines, like the firmware ones within the Amstrad CPC, and you can have your own joystick or keyboard reading routine, as long as you're providing data in the same format and that format is that I need a single byte with each bit in the byte representing up, down, left, right and a fire button. We won't actually use the fire button in this example but that's the way I tend to work. So if you were to replace this function with that then you would be able to use whatever joystick system you wanted and we'll look at the keyboard routine later. So let's have a look at the code we're going to be discussing today. Now I'm using a common cursor reading routine. This was taken originally from Chibi Akamas. This was used in the main menu where you could just select the different options and it's now been upgraded and sort of repurposed for a new game that I'm developing. So we're going to have a look at it here and it's been designed to be configurable so that it can work with any layout so you can define a range and you cu your cursor will move within that range. So it's easy to use and it also now works in ROM. It's had all of its self-modifying code removed and I've been doing some optimization to try and make it smaller as well. So we're going to have a look at that and also we're going to have a look at this routine here which is just a bit of initialization, a main loop for reading the input and using this draw paddle routine and drawing the paddle on the screen using our text routines within my tutorials. So let's start by looking at the parameters that the program uses. Now we need some parameters defined in RAM and they're here. So we've got a current position for the paddle. It's referred to as cursor, but that's because, as I said, this is common code that's been taken from other pieces of software. And so the position is in X, Y format, and X is the high byte and Y is the low byte here. And then we've got some ranges. So we need to set a minimum and maximum X position, a minimum and maximum Y position, and a move speed. Now, if we want the cursor to move in single units, we want this to be 1-1. One, one. But if we wanted to stop the cursor moving in the X position, what we could do is set the X position to zero. And we'll do this up here where we're initializing these variables. And now you can see I can move up and down, but I'm pressing left and right and nothing's happening. Alternatively, if I change this to two, you'll now see I can move left and right really quickly. So we've got a very easy way here of defining the maximum, that's five, and minimum, that's zero positions of the X cursor, the maximum and minimum of the Y cursor, now 14 is in hexadecimal, so that's 24 I believe, and you can see here we're setting a starting position here, we can configure fairly easy all of these values here. Now we're initializing these values with these loads here, they are also defined down here, but these are of course being overwritten by these loads. We could take the loads out and use these default ones, but for cleanness I wanted to have both. Now one thing to note about this version of the game, this won't work on systems that run from ROM like the Game Boy. It especially won't work on the Game Boy because we don't have any GBZ80 commands in here. We're using commands that don't necessarily work on the GBZ80, but I do have an alternate version of the finished version of the game which will work on systems with ROM and systems with the GBZ80. So these variables are being loaded in the main code they're not being loaded into the RAM area but that other version does do that correctly so this is a simplified version just as an example because as I say this was to try and help one of my Patreon backers who wanted some simple examples of how to program basic games so this is what I'm trying to provide here so let's look through the code so the first thing we've got here is the initialization of these parameters down here so we're just loading in the correct parameters for the move range of the cursor of the player now we want to clear the current position of the paddle. So we load in the current XY position here into HL from the variable we've got here. 
and then we are going to use this draw paddle routine which is a very simple paddle drawing routine and it draws the paddle with whatever character we have in the accumulator. So if we load a space into the accumulator we're effectively clearing the paddle and we need to do this before we move the paddle. Now one option would be to actually have two variables, last position and new position, compare the two and if they've changed delete the old position but for simplicity I'm just clearing the paddle every time. That, that might make the paddle flicker a little bit but I just want it to be as simple as possible here. Now we read in the controls here. This reads in the player one and player two controls as defined by my tutorial code, which we've looked at in a previous lesson. Now H is player one, L is player two, and by adding them together, we're saying if either of one of those defined controls is pressed, make the move. Now in Grimes Z8T, player one was the joystick and player two was the keyboard. So by doing this, we let the player use either joystick or keyboard, just a very simple way of reading in both controls and then acting upon them. Now we need to load in the current position of the paddle into DE and we're going to call this process directions command and this is the routine that handles the processing of the movements in H and it alters DE which is the current position of the cursor. We then save the cursor position again, we then load it back into HL. Now you, you, we could of course swap DE and HL but this is a stripped down version of a later version of the code so there'll be other commands in the middle here in the final version. Anyway, we load in the XY position into HL, we load in an X this time into the accumulator and run this draw paddle routine again. Finally, we wait for a while using this pause loop routine, which is just a very simple loop here. And then we jump back up to here to the main loop to do the whole thing again. So our procedure is clear paddle, read controls, process controls, draw paddle, wait, loop. And that's really it. The draw paddle is very simple. We've got a loop here. The paddle's four units tall, four characters. So we loop four times. We use the locate command because the locate command uses HL and H is X with my locate command. Then we use print char, which shows the accumulator to screen. We increase the Y position and we repeat four times. Now if I change this to a five, the paddle will be five tall. But you do need to notice that if I go off the screen here, that could be corrupting things. I would need to change my range boundaries to, for that to work correctly. But you get the idea. And also if I wanted a paddle that was made out of hash symbols, I can just do that. And there we go, we've got a paddle made out of hash symbols. So that's very straightforward. Now, what about this cursor process directions command, which is doing much of the work within this version of the game? Well, here it is. So when we run cursor process directions, we need H to contain the key presses and the bits are up, down, left, right, and fire. So if you want to use your alternate controller, you would need to define those bits correctly in H or rewrite this code. We need DE to contain the position of the cursor. So we load in the cursor move speed into BC and this will be how much we need to increment the X and Y position by if the cursor is being moved in that direction. Now we're going to use these key map definitions here. Now these are actually in a different file. So you can see each of these is mapped to a different bit and this is simply the bit position of that joystick control within the source. So up is zero, down is one and so on. We just use these to make it a bit clearer and if we needed to change it later we can do so without reprogramming every position where these directions are used. So we're testing each bit within H to see if that direction is pressed. If it's not pressed we skip over the next bit of code. Now essentially up, down, left and right are all basically the same routine here. So we're going to look at the first one in some detail which is down and then we're going to just briefly scan over the others because they're basically all the same. So here's the procedure. So first we check if the bit is down. If the bit is not down which means it is one, then it jump to here. If the button is pressed down, then the bit will be zero. So we then continue with this code here. What we need to do is we need to do a range check. We need to check if the cursor is already in the maximum position for that direction. So in the case of pressing the down button, we're gonna to need to move down. We need to load in the current position, which is in E for the Y position into the accumulator. We then need to swap into the shadow registers because we need more registers than we've actually got. And what we're going to do is we're going to load in the memory position of the limit we want to check, which in this case is the maximum Y into HL. We do this because we're going to call a function, a common function as you can see, which is going to do the range check for us. So we call this do cursor check down here. This uses the compare command with HL to check if the accumulator, which is currently pointing at the Y position, is the same as the maximum limit. Next we do another EXX which swaps back in the regular registers, basically doing the opposite part of this here so everything's back to normal. But that doesn't affect the accumulator because the accumulator AF isn't part of the shadow registers that are flipped by this EXX command. 
So next we do a return command if we've not reached the limit that is defined by the value in HL, which in this example was cursor max y. So if we get to this point, a was equal to that limit and we, are no, and we don't want to move any further. So what we do is we do a pop af. This is actually popping off the address that called cursor do check. And then we're jumping to this abandon here, which is effectively just doing a return. So what we've done here is we've abandoned the entire cursor control routine if we've already reached the limit of the direction that we were trying to move. Now this will of course move, mean that if we hold down and right and we're at the bottom of the screen we won't be able to move right. This is only a very simple cursor control routine. It's really designed for menus, not in-game code. I've kind of repurposed it for this example. So just bear with me on that. If you want to make it more complex, you could do so to fix issues like that. But as I say, this was a simple example design to give something basic for one of my patrons so they could understand a bit more easily a simple game routine. So if we get to here, then we've not gone over the limit here. So what we do is we add C, which is the Y move speed to the accumulator, which is the current Y position. And then we update the current Y position with the new accumulator. Next, we do the same for the up direction. We check if the up button's pressed. If it's not pressed, then we skip over this routine. If it is pressed, we do the same. Load in the Y position, flip the shadow registers, load in the Y range, use this cursor do check again, and so on and so on. So exactly the same as here. Now, when we're doing right and left, the procedure again is almost identical. Again, checking the right and left bits, but this time rather than the E, which is the Y position of the player, we load in D, which is the X position of the player, and we add B, which is the X move speed, rather than adding C, which was the Y move speed. So you can see here, all of these four routines are basically the same. It's just slightly different for up, down, and left, and right, depending on the joystick button, the range we want to check, and the axis we want to change. So there we go. So that's relatively straightforward. The only slightly odd thing is we've got this jump to this routine here. And part of the reason for this is I didn't want to use any self-modifying code in this example. And in fact, I also wanted to try and make the code as small as possible. I'm, I'm currently re-optimizing this. I think one thing I've noticed here is we could change this to a return and this would actually work just fine. Yes, that does seem to work okay. So uh, I, I say there's obviously still a little bit of work done on the optimization, but I didn't want it to have any self-modifying code so it could run from ROM and I'm still trying to make it as small as I can. So there we go. Anyway, so that's the start of this example. We've got here a cursor routine that works re reasonably well. It's easily reconfigurable. As I showed before, you can change the move speed, but you can also change the move range very easily. If I change this to an F and compile again, I can now move a much wider range. And of course, the important thing to notice is because this cursor processing routine is separate from the drawing routine, if you just wanted to process joystick input and not show anything to the screen at all, then you can do that too. So it, it should hopefully be an easy way to start from processing joystick input and turning it into a numerical value that you can use for other purposes. Anyway, that's enough for this episode. Next episode, we're going to pad this out to a full game. So if you like this, please follow to see that. Thanks for watching today anyway, and goodbye.